Alrighty, here we are one more time. I don't know, I hope some of you looked this weekend on the uh, web, our website, to see that I had emailed you all to ask you to bring um, the storyteller back to class because remember I was sort of saying well are we done are we not done and it took me about three steps out of class chatting with uh, some of your colleagues to realize that we really haven't gone over some of the aspects of the storyteller so if you don't mind and even if you don't have your novel with you I would like to just point out some passages that I feel really are important for the understanding of of this important and difficult novel. I think it is a difficult novel, the, the storyteller. So I'm going to take the first 15 minutes or so before we get on to our next novel, Elena Garro's uh, Recollections of Things to Come, and just try to uh, fill in some of the gaps that I probably should have earlier. Well, we didn't have time to. Um, on the cover of my book, my ancient paperback. Well, I have lots of things pasted on the covers of my books and lots of stickies. Where was the world? What did we do without stickies? Um, but one of my little stickies says, the existence of anything, the existence of anything, depends upon fitting it into the image of reality valid at a particular moment. What that means is we can't see something or anything that isn't in the world view that we inhabit. I put it on the front of this novel for obvious reasons, because this book is so much about two conflicting world views and what is invisible to one culture is visible to the other and vice versa. So I, I just kind of like that. The idea, we have one of the ideas of our culture, American, mainstream U.S. culture is that we can dream up new things at any time, that we can just be very original, how we value originality. You know, if someone's not original, they're not anything. Um, but it's not true. It's, I, I think in a way it's not true. Of course, originality paradigm shifts, that phrase that was invented by somebody or other. Thomas Kuhn, K-U-H-N, who wrote about those moments when Galileo, for example, well, it's really um, Copernicus figured out that the world went around the sun rather than vice versa until then it was, and we can think of a million examples where, you know, women can't be doctors, for example, the paradigm shift of feminism in the mid to late 20th century. So I, I just like that phrase and I thought I'd share it with you. The existence of anything depends upon fitting it into the image of reality valid at a particular moment. It is, we know it too from when we start, say we learn, I don't know if you've had this experience, but I expect you have, if you learn a new word, suddenly you see it in the newspaper the next day, or if you, a friend, I spend a lot of time talking to people who do what I do, literature professors, and I have a number of friends, and one will be working on a project and she'll tell me about it, or he'll tell me about that, and pretty soon I'm seeing books that are relevant to that topic that I would never have noticed otherwise, and sending the friend references on, on the internet. So it is like once we have an eye for it, we we can see it, but how do you get the eye for it? Well, through experience or whatever. But anyway, I, I do think one of the great strengths of the storyteller is this capacity to suggest how hugely different human beings can be and how hugely different human cultures are and how uh, raise the whole issue of how, how such differences can be mediated if they can be mediated. And indeed, the novel, though it celebrates the storyteller and it celebrates in particular one of them, I think s suggests a pretty unhappy future for the contact of primitive. If I use the word primitive with quotes around it, I don't mean it as a negative term, but let's say how ancient cultures, or in this case, indigenous Amazonian cultures can ever survive against the oil companies, against m m modernity. Modernity with its capitalism, with its exploitation of nature. Indeed, our notion of developing nature is, is considered to be good rather than bad. These incredibly conflicting worldviews. Okay, now I wanted to point out to you two references, which I know it's clear that Vargas Llosa and his surrogate narrator, that I narrator, who seems to be a young Vargas Llosa, though we have to remember he's a created fictional character, but nonetheless very close, it seems, to the author. Um, surely he read these sources, and I've mentioned to you they're in our library. Um, 
I just, we don't have to go there, but there are Dominican friars who in the 20s and 30s, no, 30s and 40s, lived with the Machiguenga group and wrote books that describe their belief systems. You can be sure that Vargas Llosa was using this as he's creating the narratives that his storyteller tells, because these reflect the worldview that you wrote about in your quiz last time. I didn't finish quite all of the quizzes, but most of you were quite good at noticing the animism, noticing the nomadism, noticing the um, practically non-boundary between life and death, the, the various uh, worldview, or let's see, aspects of the worldview that uh, Vargas Llosa puts into his storytelling storyteller. So if you'll mark down pages 81 and 157, we have references to Vicente de Sena, Seniga, Senitagoya, C-E-N-I-T-A-G-O-Y-A, it's right on the printed page, page 81. On page 157, again, reference to not only Senitagoya, but two others, um, Ferrero and someone named Asa. If you look at, well, we can, I'll turn to 157. I'm afraid many of you don't have your books because I told you not to bring them last time. Uh, but the Dominican missionaries are referring fa fa Fathers Pio Asa, Vicente de Senigatoya, Senitagoya and Andres Ferrero, who wrote about them in the 30s and 40s when there were frequent allusions to the storytellers. Here, the narrator is considering mm -hmm. why storytellers were so obvious to the earlier ethnographers and then become kind of hidden and invisible. And you'll remember that, that discussion. Um, those of you that have your books, if you are on page 157, I, that particular, and just take a little note if you don't have your book to go back when you're reviewing for the final and when you're just underlining and thinking about the issues raised here. Here we have what we have at the very end of the novel, and we did read together, the narrator celebrating the tradition of the storyteller. On 157, he's as lyrical, as kind of enthusiastic as we're ever going to see him. Uh, if you'll look just down, well, a little bit below, halfway down the page, um, the question here about why did modern anthropologists never mention storytellers? This is after the reference to the Dominican missionaries who wrote up their belief systems in the 30s and 40s. It was a question I, question I asked myself each time one of these studies or field observations came to my attention. And I saw once again that no mention was made even in passing of those wandering tellers of tales. Now listen to this who seem to me to be the most exquisite and precious exemplars of that people numbering a mere handful and who in any event had forged that curious emotional link between the Machi Gwengas and my own vocation. The guy's a writer. We know that from the very first pages of this framed narration. That would be another reason to talk about why this frame, this older writer looking back on his youth and this fellow he knew in college and this trip to the Amazon because the storyteller is the earlier version of the writer, right? So this this emotional link between the Machi Gwengas and my own vocation, novelist, then in parentheses not to say quite simply my own life. So the narrator here is clearly uh, very taken by this uh, by this tradition of storytelling and by the cultural importance that the storyteller has in the world. It would be like a novel, or if I find a culture where literary criticism and professors of literature are so important to the culture, I'd say, gee whiz, I wish, we, I, wish I were in that culture. Or, <laughs> or I'd say, I admire that culture because they, um, they value what I do. So in a way, that's what's going on here. Okay, so those two references to what are historical sources, if anybody's dying for a paper topic, this is a good one. Take the two books on the historians, sorry, on the historical treatments by the Dominican missionaries. Look at how Dominican missionaries write history because they write it from a very particular point of view, which would be a Catholic one. Uh, and we know that the Schneels, who are embodied in the novel, are doing something like the same thing, studying the culture for the purposes of converting the people. So you end up with that irony, which we've seen lots of times already before, which is the irony that 
those very people who are hoping to extirpate the culture, to pull it up by the roots, that's what that means, extirpate, as you know, extirpate the culture and replace it with Christianity, are recording that culture that they're hoping to evangelize and ultimately to destroy. Now, I'm not saying that converting to Catholic Catholicism in Latin America was destruction of a spiritual destruction. I don't make a value judgment, but eventually the, this is a Western form that will overtake and uh, subsume indigenous cultures. As even though we can celebrate hybridity and synchronicity and syn syncretism and so forth, um, so we can, in the end, if we go to Mexico, we say, well, who conquered whom? Because Mexican culture is so so marked by indigenous culture, but that doesn't mean it's not radically changed as well. Okay, so those historians I wanted to point out to you. Now, the issue of Kafka in this novel, I, I just, I don't know why we didn't talk about this in class, but we didn't. Next time I teach this novel, and even now, I'm going to get the Metamorphosis, the short story by Franz Kafka, scanned and put up on our website, and I'll ask you to read it. It's a short story. Many of you already know it. It's almost like Moby Dick. You say Moby Dick, and you say whale, you say the Metamorphosis, and you say cockroach, right? <laughs> it's the story of a young man named Gregor Samsa who wakes up one morning in his apartment in Prague and realizes he's, he's a cockroach. And he yells to his mother, help, help, I can't get out of bed, and his little legs are, are flailing in the, in the air. And his mother takes it, it's one of the early examples of magical realism, his mother says, oh dear, 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 you do seem to be a cockroach, and somehow they take him, but he, he can't get out of, it's a kind of existential angst nightmare. You know, it's, I don't know if you have, what kinds of nightmares you have, but sometimes I have a nightmare that I can't, I can't walk, or I'm really in a hurry, but I'm trying to dial the phone. See how old I am? I remember when those dials were like that. I can't dial the phone. <laughs> this is the, a story of this kind of terrible psychological frustration. Um, so, so I want you to read the metamorphosis because what's important about it? It's that this is a story about metamorphosis. It's the metamorphosis. That's metamorphosis means change, changing from one shape to another. We now more and more use the verb to morph. To morph. It's uh, it's in the dictionary. It's not not um, high English, I suppose, but. Uh, the word protean also can be used here, P-R-O-T-E-A-N, protean. Proteus was the god who changed shapes all the time, uh, the Greek, uh, Greek or Latin version of Proteus. So we speak of a protean figure, meaning uh, one who can, you know, be a housewife one moment and a student the next and a mother the next, a protean, usually we use it in larger, larger terms. But um, this is a story of metamorphosis. It's the metamorphosis of Saul, and it's therefore not surprising that Saul loves this story and that he integrates it. And he's also Kafka, as I said last time, was a Jew, German-speaking Czech Jew, grew up, lived in uh, Prague led a, r a rather solitary life. Um, you can look up his life if you like, but um, the fact is he's one of the great sort of modernist middle European or central European uh, writers. And so the metamorphosis needs to be read. I want to just take you to a couple of references there to Gregor Samsa, who is the guy who wakes up and finds that he has become a giant bug. That's how it's lately translated, instead of insect. We always used to read it. it was a, he woke up, there's a, it's a famous first sentence, he woke up to find that he had become an insect, a giant insect. Uh, and then lately a translation says giant bug. I don't read German, so I can't tell which is better. Look at page 63, and if you don't have it, I'll just... This is with embedded in the storyteller's story. This is where we're starting to get the idea that this isn't your normal Machi Gwenga storyteller. Um, it's a reference clearly to Kafka's metamorphosis. If you count up, uh, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, ten or eleven lines from the bottom of page 63, that sense until certain things started happening to them. Do you find it there? It's three quarters of the way down, if you want to count from top to bottom. One fine day, Tasurinci woke up covered with fish scales, where with a tail where his feet had been. Remember we talked about that 
in another passage last time how people will s suddenly have claws and so forth, this idea that the shapes of people and things and animals are permeable. Selves morph, okay? So here we have Tasurinchi woke up one day covered with fish scales with a tail where his feet had been. He looked like an enormous karachama. Now we don't know quite what that is, but we're, we're gonna assume it's the fish. Vargas Llosa won't leave you in doubt very long about what the word is. Yes, the fish that lives in water and on land, the fish that swims and walks. See, it's already a protean figure, a fish that walks, a fish that can live on land. It's, it's a shape changer. It's someone that doesn't listen to those. It's an animal that can do more than one thing. All right, well, we can say crocodiles do that. We have some like that. Yeah, okay, so this one does too. Dragging himself painfully along, he took refuge in the pond, muttering mournfully that he couldn't bear life on land because he missed the water. A few moons later, when he woke up, wings had sprouted where Tasurinchi's arms used to be. He gave a little hop, and they saw him take off and disappear into the trees, beating his wings like a hummingbird. A snout and tusks grew on Tasurinchi, and his sons, not recognizing him, shouted excitedly, a sahino, let's eat it. When he tried to tell them who he was, all he could do was snort and grunt. He's become something else yet, a pig, a snout. He had to make his escape, trotting clumsily on four stumpy legs he hardly knew how to use, pursued by a hungry horde a aiming arrows and stones at him. Let's catch it, let's chase it down. The earth was running short of men. Some had turned into birds, some into fish, others into tortoises, others, and so forth. And since we were about to disappear, this is what we saw last time. But I wanted to connect it to the metamorphosis. Now, hang on, because you can say, well, that's kind of a stretch. There, you know, it's a fish and it's a pig and this isn't a cucaracha. There's this famous season, scene where his father, the cucaracha is in the corner, and the father knows it's his son, Gregor but he throws an apple at it, and the apple becomes embedded in the cucaracha's back, the uh, insect, I should say, the insect's back. Well, that wouldn't happen. An apple would crush <laughs> such an insect, but then it becomes all festering and so forth. So you could say, well, there really aren't any of the identifiers, but you, let's keep going. First of all, we know at the very beginning, we're told that he's a big fan of the metamorphosis by Kafka, that Saul is. So we've already been, you know, we've been given a hint. Yeah, um, would you push the button, please, Lisa? Thank you. In, uh, in the metamorphosis, I think there's a lot of talk about um, him not knowing how to use his legs. Oh, so yes, that, that's, that's a very good point. Yeah, the leg issue. Yeah, no, he, he can't get off his back. He's been lying there, a person, we assume, and then suddenly he's this other thing and he can't get turn over. And yes, yeah, it really is a, a night mere vision of incapacity, let's say, and so we thank you. So that's an interesting point. Even so, if we hadn't been told at the outset, we probably wouldn't say, ah, oh, Kafka's metamorphosis, but we're starting to see that Saul is fascinated not only by Kafka's metamorphosis, metamorphosis, which being, as a college student, we've been told he is, but we see it because he himself is transforming himself into something uh, else. Now, look at 203. Here it's quite explicit. So here we can hardly, not, hardly ignore it, even if we hadn't been told. Uh, it's the top of 203 where we get Gregor Tasurinci. Now, you can say Gregor wouldn't be enough either without the earlier indications. Maybe not, but it's a bit like saying Ahab and you say, oh, Melville. You know, Gregor, if you said to me, or if I said Anna and said, what famous heroine is Anna? I'd say Anna Karenina. There are really some characters that become very associated with their name. So who knows? Maybe we'd say that, maybe we wouldn't. If we hadn't read it, we wouldn't, which is why uh, I, I do want to put it up and have you take a look at it. Page 203, top, that was after by the Tapir River. I was people. I had a family. I was asleep. Then I, awoke, then I woke up. This is actually Gregor here. I barely opened my eyes when I understood. Alas, poor Tasurinchi, I changed into an insect. That's what, a buzz, buzz, bug, perhaps. A uh, Gregor Tasurinchi. I was lying on my back. The world had grown bigger, it seemed to me. I was, I was aware of everything. Those hairy, ringed legs were my legs. Yes, here comes the leg part. Those transparent, mud-colored wings which creaked when I moved and hurt me so much had once been my arms. A stench that surrounded me, was that my odor? I saw the world differently, and so forth. 
So you see now, and this is one more story of metamorphosis. You know Ovid's metamorphosis, O-V-I-D, the very famous <laughs> stories that Aesop and others also pick up on, though Ovid's metamorphosis, are stories where gods are turning from one thing into another, Greek gods. And Ovid, the Roman writer, writes this up, you know, 2,000 years ago. So the metamorphosis, if you look, if you Google metamorphosis, you're going to get a lot of Ovid stories like Apollo chasing Daphne and Daphne doesn't want to be caught by Apollo so she turns into a tree and etc. There are lots of, uh, we should read that one too I guess because here what's so interesting about the worldview, you know we've talked about the nomadism, the keeping moving, but moving pr here implies morphing. Is that, so what do we do with that? I mean what do we make of that? Well. I've just been doing the same thing about three times. I'll do it a fourth time. Maybe it's not very uh, clever the fourth time. And that is to say that Saul himself is moving and morphing. What do we do with that? Well, that just happens to be, uh, is the world moving and morphing? Well, that last paragraph that we looked at in Florence where everybody, you know, that motley group of different people from different areas of the world, who, I'm not sure what we want to do with the emphasis that there is on the metamorphosis, both Kafka's and Saul's, and Saul's stories of metamorphosis. But it, at least the first thing we can do is, is notice that it's, that it's there. I, I wanted also to look at the parrot. You see there was a lot that we <laughs> didn't look at. Um, I'm just going to give you the page numbers. I don't think we need to look at them too much, but actually one of you in your quiz said something very interesting which I had never thought of and that is that the parrot is such a pal of the storyteller because the parrot is a storyteller. The parrot talks and the parrot, I mean, maybe all of you had thought of that, but you know it could have been some other kind of, let's say, pet uh, that would identify this particular storyteller, but it's pages 48, 122, and 130 where we see specific references to the parrot with Tasurin, with um, Saul Mascarita becoming, re referring to his own parrot, so we know, we know that's uh, him. We don't necessarily know that it, I should say that it's he, I should speak correct English, shouldn't I? We know that's he. Um, we may or may not figure it out, but by the end we know for sure because uh, the, the narrator in Florence at the end, uh, at the beginning, seeing, but especially at the end, seeing that picture seems to think there's a parrot on the shoulder of one of the pictures of the storyteller. So I just call that, again, it's a little, let's say little crumbs, <laughs> like uh, that are left that were like, um, Hansel and Gretel that were to follow to solve, if you want, this, this plot question of who is this, this storyteller. By the end, it's clear that Vargas Llosa wants us to know that it's Mascarita, and he celebrates him for his total immersion in Machi Wenga cul culture. And as I've said, and some of you on your quizzes also said, there's some uh, troubling aspects of that, becoming the other. It's one thing to respect the other, another to become the other. First of all, is it possible? Probably not, uh, etc. So that, that theme of otherness and the relation of different cultures is, is certainly there. One last look here, and that's going to, so we see Gregor Samsa's story coming in. We just looked at it, that, that 203, where this Kaf Kafka becomes a part of the storyteller and the Machi Gwenga tradition. Then there's the Christ story, and I really do think we have to look at that. It's interesting because we know Mascarita is Jewish, and we know that he's terribly opposed to Christianizing or evangelizing indigenous cultures. So it's very odd that here he integrates, but he absolutely does, the story of um, Christ into his, one of his narratives, it's 215, and we don't need to look at it too closely, but I wanted to point it out. We actually even get Jehovah Tasurinci. We're told before we had Gregor Tasurinci, now we have Jehovah Tasurinci just below the halfway point on the page there. And then just look a little bit at the um, last paragraph where we get the, trili uh, the Trinity uh, and so forth. Until one day in a remote little ravine a child was born, he was different. A Seri Gorampi 
Yes, perhaps. He started saying, I am the breath of Tasurinchi, I'm the son of Tasurinchi, I am Tasurinchi. I am all three things at once. Sound familiar? That's what he said. Then he'd come down from Inkite to this world sent by his father, who was himself to change the customs because the people had become corrupt. I'm sorry, he was sent by his father, who was himself. In other words, his father sends him in another form to change, shape changing as well, to, to change the customs because the people had become corrupt, etc. He must have listened to them in astonishment, saying he must be an hablador, saying those must be stories he's telling. He went from place to place. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You read it and think about this, let's say, um, intervention, this intervention of the Christ Christian story by this particular storyteller. All the way through page seven, 217, there's a long description of, the, of Christ. The next page, 218, there's reference to anti-Semitism, to anti-Jewish sentiment, and so forth. So this whole, this whole section here, um, now becomes, and you know what, it becomes easier to understand too. You think, when, I, when, when you read, first read this, I don't know, your experience, mine was those non-Western chapters, I had to flog myself through them. Ugh, can't understand it, who's what, and, you know, but I'm studying the book because I'm going to teach it, so I guess I'd better know what I'm doing. And so I make myself, by the time you get to the later non-Western chapters, they read much more like Western narrative, like this, it's much, it's, it's easier. And I thought, well, maybe I've just gotten used to this odd form of narration, but the fact is, I think um, the Western stories are becoming more integral into the, the, the storyteller's art. Okay, well, sorry, that's a quick run through. Anybody, I mean, there's so much more in this, in this novel, but I do ask you, once I get the Metamorphosis by Kafka up on the web to, to read it, um, it's very different from this story, but it obviously is an important allusion within this novel. And if you haven't read it, then it, it's, you miss something. So that, I, I guess, I wanted to, to make a point of. Uh, other comments or questions about the novel? Please do persevere and make yourself read the non-Western chapters, because they will become clear to you, because in the chapter following, usually, they are explained in one way or another. But it's an exercise for us, I think, if we're interested in Latin America and we're interested in Latin American culture, to try to put ourselves into a, the mindset of a culture that is so far from our own. We test that statement with which I began, the existence of anything depends upon fitting it into the image of reality valid at a particular moment. So we'll see if we can do that. Comments or questions then about Vargas Llosa? Okay. Now, goody, we get to go on to Elena Garro. And I hope you're enjoying the novel. Everybody got a copy by now? I think in a sad way, I probably won't teach this novel again, or maybe I will, you never know. We're having this film for future generations, we'll see. But I, I'm sorry that you've had so much trouble, some of you, in getting hold of it. Um, Karsna, did you finally get it out of the downtown library? Yep. Good. Somebody else was about to check it out, and then, <gasps> Holy, and they put it back on the shelf, so I ran and grabbed it. Oh, good, it. yeah, yeah. good. Everybody else okay? Okay, good. Yeah, you're reading in Spanish. That's good. You can help us with the... So the only copy left in the library. Oh, good, yes. <laughs> you know, when, when I thought maybe Karzna had disappeared on me, I knew you wouldn't, Karzna. I, I went to find my Spanish copy. I thought, well, I'll do that, too. I, I, I couldn't find mine, so now I've got two mysteries, this one and the next, but it'll surround someplace. Okay, first I want to fill in the historical background here. I said I was going to have you write a little bit, and I may yet. Uh, we may... Um, finish a little early and I'll, I'll ask you to just curious about your take on this novel. I know that Amanda is saying that she loves it even better than Garcia Marquez, which is a lot to say. Um, I actually find it a very lyrical and beautiful novel. Elena Garro um, 
was the wife of a terrible thing. To, I shouldn't start with who her famous husband was, but I will. Octavio Paz, the great novelist uh, and essayist and n not novelist, poet. He, he did write fiction, but great poet and essayist. We read his essay at the very beginning of this class. Garro was married to him for, I think, quite a while in the 40s into the 50s. I need to look up those th that trajectory a little more closely, but it's a bit... Um, well, she, she um, was certainly not the famous writer that he was and became, but over the years she's really uh, gotten to be more and more known and appreciated. It is hard to figure, as Amanda was commenting last time, how University of Texas lets this book go out of print. Uh, they could make money selling it to us, and it's even hard to get um, used copies, apparently. So it's not a, a novel that's all that well known or that... Um, sought after, but I, I find it very admirable and, and I hope you, you are enjoying it. Okay, so contemporary Mexican novel about a period in the 1920s and into the 1930s in Mexico. This has a very particular historical setting and the setting is the Cristero Rebellion, C-R-I-S-T-E-R-O, the Christ Rebellion. The, you will know about this, and we're going to look at some pages where it's very specifically discussed. I want to start with the historical context. Um, the, who knows about the Cristero Rebellion? Who's a study, a student of Mexican, recent, fairly recent Mexican history? Anybody? Yeah. Did you, did you check it out, Lisa? because it relates to Juan Rulfo, which was my paper. Um, and Juan Rulfo grew up in the area where there were a lot of decisive battles, but the Cristero Revolution, and I probably shouldn't raise my hand because I can't be that specific, but it was a, it was a rebellion that took place after the Constitution was um, overthrown, and it had to do with people's rebellion against the church because the church was the power at the time. Well, that's the Mexican Re Revolution, is the rebellion against the church. This is a kind of backlash right. by Catholics right. against the revolution because they want the church. Power in their yeah. land. Yeah. So, so you're, you're on the right, uh, right track. Um, maybe I'll back up for a minute and, and fill it in, or do you want to keep going? Thank you. Um, Mexico is very interesting in its relationship to the Catholic Church. It's the most Catholic of countries. It's, it's a, I mean, it's highly practicing Catholic country. There are other denominations of Christianity, and there's Jewish community and so forth, but basically it's pretty much Catholic. What happens with the liberal reforms in the middle of the 19th century in Mexico? you know the name Juarez. Well, Juarez was president of Mexico in the 1850s. There's what are called the liberal reforms. There's a new constitution of 1857 overseen by, the pre by President Juarez, which limits the power of the Catholic Church. Why? Because the Catholic Church hasn't wanted to give up control of the country. The Catholic Church and indeed the Spanish bureaucracy. We've learned, we saw a bit of this in Carlos Fuentes. We didn't look closely at it, but but it was in the section that we were were asked to read. Okay, so the Juarez is a liberal. By liberal, he means we'll say for now in favor of democracy, in favor of or let's say against oligarchic or hierarchical institutions that limit freedom, limit individual freedom. So that, so that Juarez starts the process, but what happens after Juarez in Mexico? Well, there's the French invade and there's Maximilian for three years, so there's a French empire in Mexico. But Juarez basically comes back, well, there's the Battle of the Cinco de Mayo, that's in 1870, I believe. Ooh, dear, no, 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 it's got to be 1865 or so, I'll have to check that. And the French are kicked out by a general named Porfirio Diaz, who becomes for 40 years dictator 
of Mexico from 1870 to 1910, more or less. He's elected and then re-elected. There's not supposed to be re-election, but he puts up somebody, and then it turns out that the somebody's really him. And so there's a long period of dictatorship. We're going to see that word porfirista in this novel quite a lot. It comes from Porfirio Diaz. What happens in 1910, Francisco Madero, among others, this is all very schematic, decide that he can't be reelected yet again. This is enough. And so Francisco Madero, whose name comes up is also, is um, unites support against Porfirio Diaz and for something that looks more like a democratic regime with real elections. So figure 1910, that is, we like to say 1910 to 1917 is the Mexican Revolution. It is a civil war. It's called a civil war in here. It's the liberals against the conservatives. We've seen it. Uh, if you've read A Hundred Years of Solitude, that's the, the problem. And who, who are the liberals and the conservatives? Well, the landowners versus those who don't own land. There, there are various uh, ways. But basically, the conservatives prefer a, a dictatorship. It's more comfortable and so forth. We have to look at the way that Galeano treats this, this subject. Um, so we get leaders coming up like Zapata and like Pancho Villa, who's another story. Pedro Angeles is mentioned here. Revolutionary leaders who are really fighting against the government and for land reform, for um, the end of peonage, the end of basically a feudal system where the labor is attached to the land and people live on the land, work the land, and the owner of the land reaps the, the profits. So, so we have the Mexican Revolution. In 19, the reason we say 1910 to 1917 is there's a new constitution under Carranza, Venustiano Carranza, who's president at the time, C-A-R-R-A-N-Z-A. -R -R -A -A. This name's going to come up here, too. We're going to look at these in a minute. Carranza writes a new um, constitution. It's the one that still operates in Mexico, the Constitution of 1917. This outlaws the church almost entirely. This Constitution says, no, we, our liberal reforms and the Constitution of, 19, of 1857 were not strong enough. The church still has too much power. It has too much property. The priests have too much, um, too much authority. We're going to make the church all government property, so all church property is expropriated. Some of it had already been in, in, in the middle of the 19th century. People got rich on that. The post-revolutionary period, Priests are forbidden to walk on the street with their collars. Their nuns cannot walk on the street with their habit in this most Catholic of countries. And indeed, priests at this time after the revolution, let's say starting in the 1920s, had to hide out. The most famous novel of the Cristero period is Graham Greene's novel, The Power and the Glory. If you happen to have it's a movie, it's, uh, it's about a priest in Mexico who has to go into hiding, a bit like the one in this, this novel. So it's a period of terrible repression against the church. And you say, well, isn't that great? That's another liberal reform. The church can no longer be the kind of heavy-handed force that it's been. But indeed, there are a lot of people who didn't feel that way at all. And that's what this novel's about. Because those people rise up, particularly in the northern states of Jalisco, where Juan Rulfo, the great writer of the Mexican Revolution and other things, uh, was from the, the, in, in the north, north of Mexico City, northwest really, um, was the area where really a lot of people died. What happened? It's a counter-revolution. It's that the people are saying, now wait a minute, we like the church, we want baptism, we want marriage. We want priests. We, we want it like it was. So you can say it's a, con serve a conservative reaction to the liberal reforms, but the liberal reforms went very, very far. It's very interesting that only in, I think, 1992 did the president of Mexico, then um, Salinas de Gortari, reestablish relations with the Vatican. So one of the most Catholic countries in the world, really, um, had no official relation to the Catholic Church after the revolution. So it's, it's one of those odd uh, ironies. Salinas de Cortardi reinstituted um, official diplomatic relationships with relationship between Mexico and the Vatican. And when Vicente Fox, the past president of Mexico, was inaugurated in 2000 and 
in 2000, he actually went to Mass, he's very Catholic, he went to Mass before he went then to be inaugurated and all of Mexico was saying, oh no, you know, our government's going to go back, not all of Mexico, some I think thought it was a very admirable and very open gesture. Um, and others felt, no, this was, you know, it's been a very much a tradition of separation of church and state. It was bought, that separation was bought at a huge cost. And now what's Vicente Fox going to mass before he goes to, to uh, be, be politically inaugurated? So, so it's, it's part of this whole struggle between the Catholic state, sorry, the Catholic church and the nation state of Mexico for uh, autonomy and for coexistence. What we get dramatized here is the moment when it's not working at all well. That there are armies that are called uh, cristeros, the, the, the soldiers are called cristeros. They're, that E-R-O, zapatero is a shoemaker. E-R-O means, I can't even do it in English because we don't have the same, but it's someone who does. So cristero is one who is of Christ. And the cristero rebellion is what it's called. The, the, armies rode into battle against the government troops yelling viva cristo rey long live christ the king they carried flags with um the virgin of guadalupe on them if anybody wants a great paper topic that's this you can put this one in its historical context very well the historian a frenchman actually who's lived in mexico forever named jean may or j-e-a-n the jean m-e-y-e-r is the great um historian of the Cristero Rebellion. His books are like that. You may not want to get into them too much. They're also huge picture, pictographic, photographic rather, rec records of the Cristero Rebellion. So it's a very rich territory. Can you read this novel and not know anything about the Cristero Rebellion? Of course you can. You just, it seems a bit the background. But I think it's important, especially because the point of this class is to see how novelists treat historical context, uh, to look at, at a couple of passages here. So this novel then should take you and does take you to the Mexican Revolution and the post, let's say the fallout or the backlash against the liberal reforms of the Mexican Revolution. Okay, I want you to look at a couple pages where names are named. Let's start with 64 and 65. Um, this, of course, General Rosas, who's the, the dictator of this village, this town, this ghost town, by the way, we'll start next time by looking at how this novel begins, that beautiful voice that comes out of the earth, the rock upon which the town used to sit. We know that this is a kind of ghost town, don't we? It seems we go back and we see the people, but this is a very depressing novel in the sense that it predicts very bad things for, for such a village as this one. Um, and such a history as this one. It does seem um, to say that things aren't going to end well. But look at top of 64. It's one quarter of the way down. Our troubles began with Madero. Now, I just mentioned Francisco Madero. The leader, his, he was president of Mexico. He was elected after Porfirio Diaz got himself to France. He left in exile, a man already 70 years old, Diaz. And Madero becomes president. He's president between 1911 and 1913, at which point he is killed, assassinated, by someone named Huerta. This is what's being discussed at the moment, clearly backed by the U.S., by the way. We didn't like it that there was an uprising. We preferred our dictator to the South, all that nice stability and everything. We didn't, you know, we've always been very friendly, with the exception of Castro, to dicta <coughs> dictators in and now uh, Chavez, too, is causing us a little concern. But, but um, so anyway, you can look up Madero and you can look up how he's assassinated. But he becomes, as you would understand, for liberals, a hero and a martyr. And for conservatives, somebody who upset the apple cart. So he's a hero for some and he's a villain for others. And that's what's going on on the two pages that we're going to look at here. It's um, Doña Elvira and Martín Moncada are talking, and we know that Martín Moncada is a liberal, and clearly Elvira is not. So look at what happens. Our troubles began with Madero, she said, sighing perfidiously. 
she knew that an argument would bring the dying conversation back to life. She knows she's, she's saying something that Martine won't agree with. So it's all his fault, that guy that got uppity and wanted after 40 years that Porfirio shouldn't continue. The forerunner of Francisco Rosas is Francisco Madero, Tomás Segovia said sententiously. Okay, now he's disagreeing with her. He's saying that, I'm sorry, maybe he's agreeing with her here. It's very hard to tell where, where they're coming down. The forerunner of this dictator was this other dictator. So that's, that's his position. The figure of General Rosas appeared in the dark center of the garden and came up to the forlorn group of Doña Matilde's porch. He is the only one who has the right to live, they said to themselves bitterly, and felt that they were caught in an invisible web, web that left them without money, without love, without a future. He is a tyrant. Uh -huh. Okay, so go back to Segovia. Segovia is basically saying Rosas wouldn't be here if it weren't for Madero. So he, like Elvira, is saying it's all Madero's fault. This guy upset the apple cart because he didn't like a dictator. He wanted democracy. And it's actually true that Madero was, con was considered to be and is considered to be a hugely important figure because at least he gets the ball rolling in the Mexican Revolution. The, many years later, Mexicans are proud of their revolution. They say, yes, there was land reform. Yes, the church was probably over-controlled, but at least was brought into something like a reasonable realm of power and so forth. So um, he's a tyrant. This is referring to Rosas. You don't have to tell our guest he saw it with his own eyes. Since the general has been here, he has done nothing but commit crimes and crimes and more crimes. There was ambiguity in Segovia's voice. He seemed almost envying, to be envying Rosas, whose job it was to hang agrarian reformers instead of sitting on the porch of a mediocre house saying useless words. Okay, so what's Rosas doing? Hanging agrarian reform reformers. He's putting back the land-owning system where it was. Who would ha hang an agrarian reformer? Someone who's a big landholder, who doesn't want to give his land to the peasants. And so there's a bunch of stuff going on here. He must go through some terrible moments, he said to himself, feeling an intense emotion. Let's skip the Roman part. Go down to the last sentence, three lines up at the end. We have a reference here to mestizaje. We are a people of slaves with a handful of patri patricians, that is, handful of oligarchs, of privileged ones. And he placed himself with the patricians to the right of Francisco Rosas. So, so far we've heard from the conservatives, right? Although it's hard to say in Segovia. Since now, here comes the opposite perspective. Since we assassinated Madero, we have had a long night of expiation, Martin Moncada exclaims, still with his back in to the group. He says, basically saying, boy, when Madero died, we really we lost somebody important. We've, we've paid for it ever since. That's what that long night of expiation, to expiate is to pay for your crimes, basically here, to expiate. It actually means to get over your crimes. If you do a long, if you walk, to the Basilica of Guadalupe on your knees, you are expiating your sins. So we've had this long night of expiation. His friends looked at him virulently. Why? Because they disagree with him. They don't think Madero was any good. They're not in favor of the revolution. Look what's become, look what's happened. The church has had to go underground. Hadn't Madero been a traitor to his own people? He belonged to a wealthy Creole family, and yet he headed the rebellion of the Indians. His death was not only just, but necessary. This is the opposite point of view from Moncada's. He was to blame for the anarchy that prevailed in the country. The years of civil war that followed his death had been atrocious for the mestizos, whose restless, who, res, sorry, who resisted the hordes of Indians fighting for rights and lands that did not belong to them. Well, that's the landowner's point of view. If you're a reformer, you think, yeah, the land belongs to the Indians. They were there first, and there are systems that were supposed to protect indigenous lands. But they didn't. People, you know, there was land grab, right, just as there was here. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that um, the, the Indians were actually um, protected mm -hmm. 
um, better in terms of land rights yeah. and um, communal yeah. land under the Spaniards. Yeah. And mm -hmm. when the Spaniards pulled mm -hmm. out, yeah. that's when there was really no uh, organization. Yeah. Um, and the institution that had legitimized the Indians holding of the land was no longer valid so right yeah yeah unfortunately even under the Spaniards though legally you're so right that there were legal provisions made for ejidos and areas of communally owned lands for indigenous peoples even under the Span uh, Spanish those w laws weren't very well enforced so but still you're right after after independence and certainly into the 20th century forget forget indigenous land holdings there are now actually in Mexico ejidos that are respected as communally held lands rather than ones that can be bought and developed and so forth yeah but that's a that's a good point keep on going here we're going to see the mention of Benustiano Carranza I already mentioned him okay but wait, let's just go back and say, read that sentence one more time. The years of civil war that followed his death, followed 1913, Madero's death, have been atrocious for the mestizos who resisted the hordes of Indians. Okay, so we've got the landowners, mestizos, who is also criollos. We've heard about the patricians. This is all about classes. There seem to be three classes, the landowners. But the mestizos would be those mixed race people, Mexicans, who would have some stake in landowning, who had resisted the hordes of Indians fighting for rights and lands that did not belong to them. Well. That's a point of view. Did they belong to them or didn't they? According to the friends, and see, see, this is nobody is speaking here. This is the narrator. But the narrator here, and we're going to see where the narrator actually reveals herself. I like to think of the narrator here as a woman um, and her own position. But here we're getting the position of the conservatives repeated. But when Benustiano Carranza betrayed the victorious revolution and took power into his own hands, the moneyed classes had some relief. Then the assass with the assassinations of Emiliano Zapata, Francisco Villa, and Felipe Angles, they felt safe, the moneyed classes. Villa is assassinated in 1922, Zapata I think after 1923, but the fact is here they're saying, well, after a while the, the conservatives felt okay again about it because, you know, the, the revolutionary leaders are killed, Carranza, he says, betrayed the victorious revolution. I don't know quite how he did that, except with overseeing the, the Constitution of 1917. But then here you see, this is just packed with all sorts of confusion. But the generals who betrayed the revolution installed a tyrannical and, tyrannical and voracious government that shared the wealth and privileges only with their former enemies and accomplices in the betrayal, the big landholders of the days of Porfirio Diaz. So then what's alleged here is after the revolution, and it's exactly what happened indeed, the generals, the people who were the victorious re rebels, the generals, take over and they become the PRI. They become the ruling, single ruling party until the year 2000. So the, the revolution is accomplishing some things, but what we're, what we're learning at the end here of this with this reference to the landholders of Porfirio Diaz is the generals get very comfortable in power. They sell out the revolution in some ways and feel comfortable again with the big land owners. Okay, so then let's see what goes on. This is a, a paragraph that's giving us a couple of points of view, but basically the conservative point of view. On the other hand, after that word safe, they felt safe, it seems like we switch points of view and we see the liberal point of view, that the voracious government now feels friendly with the landholders hold again. So the first two thirds of that paragraph are from the conservative point of view and the last sentence or two, no, the last one sentence, the last sentence would seem to be from the liberal point of view. And then it does seem that Martin has said this last part. Martin, how can you talk like that? Do you really think we deserve Rosas? Doña Elvira Montufar asked. Her friend's words made her ashamed. 
that would be Martin. Not only Roses, but Rodolfito Gordibar and his thugs from Tabasco. In other words, after the revolution, the thugs take over. That's what he said, our revolution has been spoiled by the, the leadership. You accuse Rosas for getting that his accomplice is even more bloodthirsty. But after all, it was the follower of Porfirio Diaz who gave Victoriano Huerta the money to assassinate Madero. So here's the, the, the liberal saying, look, all you have to do is look around to see what's going on. It's the friends of Porfirio that assassinate Madero. So for him, Madero is the great hero. There's even been talk about um, beatifying Madero, it seems to me, in Mexico. Hmm. Anyway, the, so you see you're either for or again Madero, depending on whether you're for or again, again the, the revolution. The others were silent. They were really surprised at the bloody friendship between the Catholic followers of Porfirio Diaz, known as the Porfiristas, and the atheistic revolutionaries. The two groups were marked by greed and the shameful origin of the mestizo. They had inaugurated an era of barbar barbarism unprecedented in my memory. Look at that my. See, we get most of us forgetting that this is this stone, this voice, this town now disappeared that is telling the story. So it's a kind of communal narration if you want, or you can think of it, I think of it as I said, as a woman. Um, but here we see, I think, where the author comes down. This is a terrible period where greed reigns, where people like Rosas can impose their power and hang agrarian reform uh, people and so forth. So let's keep going. I don't think they, they paid to have Madero assassinated, the widow said uncertainly. Elvira, dear, Luján paid Huerta six million pesos, Moncada said hotly. You're right, Martin, and we're going to see worse things yet. Why do you think Rodolfito brought those gunmen from Tabasco to hunt stray dogs and so forth? Then there's this whole thing about the desaparecidos. Well, let's just keep going. Gunmen, it's the next paragraph. That w was still a new word, and it left us stunned. That us, I love the communal us and we, but we just saw a me, now it's us. The gunmen were a new class that came into being when the perfidious revolution merged with the movement of Porfirio Diaz. The generals are on the take and Porfiri Porfiristas are wanting the old regime. Stuffed into expensive gabardine suits, wearing dark glasses and soft felt hats, they performed the macabre task of making men vanish only to reappear as mutilated corpses. The generals called this kind of ledger domain, do you know that from the French léger, uh, sleight of hand, um, léger is light and main is hand, this kind of magic, this kind of um, trick, building a country, and the porfiristas called it divine justice. Both expressions meant dirty business and brutal plunder. Okay, I think with that you can see where the author and the author's narrator stand, and we're watching this village essentially um, be killed by the forces of this moment in Mexican history. Okay, so there's one other place I want you to go, and I'm sorry if this is a little boring, but uh, more than a little, but let me just <laughs> keep on boring you for another minute. Would you go to page 146, please? It's actually 147, a reference at the very bottom of the page to Calles. Calles, Plutarco Elias Calles, C-A-L-L-E-S, Calles, double L is pronounced like a Y in Spanish, as you know. Um, it, a reference to a very big strong man, one of these men stuffed into gabardine suits that we've just read about, that would be the way that the narrator would feel about him, who consolidates the power of the generals, consolidates the po political party known as the PRI, P-R-I, Partido Revolucionario Institucional, the single party system that, as I said, endured until the year 2000. Um, when Vicente Fox was finally elected from another party. Unfortunately, he was a failure as a president, but never mind that. Um, 
Okay. I mean, most Mexicans feel so. My husband actually defends him for, for reasons which I've kind of forgotten right now. <laughs> anyway, look at the bottom of 147. Um, up, up, up six lines. Politicians have no delicacy. Delicacy? Yes, how do they dare to consider themselves indispensable? Isabel smiled. Only her mother was capable of saying that Calles had no delicacy when he was ordering the execution of anyone who seemed to be an obstacle to his remaining in power. It's a little more serious than a lack of delicacy, and Martin Moncada continued to read the paper. Clearly, Mon Martin Moncada is the, the character here in this village who sort of sees things clearly. The rest are a little less clear, it seems. In those days, a new political calamity was beginning. Relations between the government and the church were strained. There were conflicts of interest, and the two factions in power were ready to embark on a struggle that would distract the people from the only issue it was necessary to obscure the distribution of land. See, here the narrator is being very sarcastic. Say, oh, well, have a little war here between the church and the government to keep from people from paying attention, landowners from noticing, if you want, or peasants from noticing that the distribution of the land is not happening. The newspaper spoke of the Christian faith and the revolutionary and revolutionary rights. The Catholic followers of Porfirio Diaz and the atheistic revolutionaries, so we get that same A, B, odd bedfellows kind of alliance. The ones who, like Calles, the ones who have won the revolution, who are atheists, indeed against the church, and the Catholic followers. They were digging the grave of agrarian reform altogether. Less than 10 years had passed since the two factions had agreed on the assassination of Emiliano Zapata, Francisco Villa, and Felipe Angeles, the same trio of revolutionary leaders that we've just, that we just heard about before. And the Indians, okay, so let's start that sentence again. Less than 10 years had passed since the two factions had agreed on the assassination of Emiliano Zapata, Francisco Villa and Felipe Ángeles, and the Indians still had the vivid memory of the revolutionary leaders. The church and the government fabricated a cause to irritate the discontented pe peasants. Religious persecution. Martin Moncada read the news in the paper and was depressed. Harassed by misery, the people would enter that fight. And while the peasants and the rural priests prepared for atrocious deaths, the archbishop played cards with the wives of the atheistic leaders. This is very sad, and so forth. So you see there the, how this is being understood. This religious war as a diversion, the peasants dying uh, in order that land should maintain, be maintained in the hands of, of the landowners. Okay. Let's see, 52, I'm gonna just go one more page. Look, would you go to one, uh, 152, please? Here, the Cristero War is mentioned ex quite explicitly. It, the, the chapter begins, it was afternoon, the newspaper vendors' shouts announced that religious war, worship had been suspended. Now, what's being proposed here is the government is doing this on purpose in order to divert attention from land distribution. But the fact is, it's not quite, I think that's not altogether the reason. The reason is also that the Catholic Church was being suppressed by the revolutionary government because the Catholic Church actually had had a lot of power and the revolutionary government didn't want them to have that power. Their cries crossed my streets, entered stores, penetrated houses, and put the town in motion. People came out on the street, formed in knots, and went to the church. Let's see if they've taken the saints away. Under the violet light of afternoon, the crowd was growing. Let's see who's taking the mother away from home. That, that's, that's a hard... Uh, a hard sentence. Melissa, you who have your, uh, your Spanish there, vamos a ver, I, I looked this up in Spanish, vamos a ver quien desmadra a quien. It's a very vulgar way of saying who's, who's um, screwing whom. Uh, desmadre is a, is a, so who's taking the mother away from whom? I wouldn't have translated to that. It doesn't make sense in English. Yeah, no. Who's screwing whom, I guess I'd say. Or worse, which I won't say. Enveloped, sorry? 
It, enveloped in a low voiced anger, their bare feet tanned like leather by the stones, their heads uncovered, the poor people grouped beneath the branches of the almond tree. Virgen de Guadalupe, help us with these bastards. They're praying. From time to time, a shout was heard, and then there was silence. While they waited, the men smoked cheap cigarettes, and women minded their children. What were we waiting for? So that we is always, it always comes as a surprise. We forget that it's this voice of this town telling us this story. What were we waiting for? I don't know. It's brilliant, actually, brilliant narrative technique. Very original, as I say, we appreciate that. I don't know too many narratives that go back and forth between the first person plural and the first person singular, and who represent, that first person represents some kind of vague entity. Usually a first person narr narrative is like Vargitas. You know, we know who he is, he's a character, and so forth. Here it's a, a much more abstract voice, let's say. I only know that my memory is always an interminable wait. The ladies and gentlemen of Ixtepec arrived and mingled with the Indians as if for the first time the same evil was afflicting them both. The Cristero War cuts across th these boundaries because Catholicism does. I'm gonna, the importance of the church is discussed on the next page. We're all, if you, if you want to look more closely at these particular pages, at this particular section, you will see this Cristero rebellion unfolding as the, as the church, as the government suspends mass, suspends everything. There no religious practice is to be tolerated. So a lot of it went underground. Uh, as I said, The Power and the Gro G Glory by Graham Greene is an interesting novel on that front. Okay, let me see. There are other references. There is a reference to Obregón, also president of Mexico. What was his first name? Alvaro Obregón. He was president from 1924 to 1928. Calles, Plutarco, Calles comes in uh, 28 in Adelante. He doesn't want to give up power either. But it's this period then, let's say, between uh, Carranza, as mentioned, 1910, but, but the actual action of the novel is going on in the 20s during this period, let's say from 24, 25, 26, after the death of the revolutionaries, it's referred to the death of Villa and Zapata uh, into the 30s, into the era of Plutarco Elias Calles. Okay, so at least you get a little bit of the um, the background, now you could say that's the least of it, you know, we could read this novel, it's a very beautiful invocation of memory, of loss, of communal complications, it's a small town, and so, so forth, we can get into the magical realism of the novel, it's very beautiful in a way, how things happen that don't really happen, the disappearance of Julia, the uh, odd ticks of some of the characters. We can really do a lot with the novel besides locate it in Mexican political history. But I thought we'd better do that first. Um, has any, does anybody think of the murals of Diego Rivera as you read this novel? Are you aware of the murals? Maybe we should do that slideshow. I decided not to show you the Peruvian images that I put on the uh, the syllabus as showing you because they don't seem to me to be terribly relevant. Um, but maybe we'll look at some of Diego Rivera's murals. There's a lot of this period um, depicted in kind of the same style in a way as, um, as the novel, the, the different factions uh, fighting for, for stuff for land, for power, for prestige. So, okay, well I'm gonna let you go. Any questions or comments at this point? I know I can see some of you are into the novel and some of you finished it, some of you love it. Yeah, Ju Julie? Um, so I know religion was um, a main point or the, the focal point of the Cristero Rebellion, but what about um, agrarian land reform? Was well, that implicitly? Well, the point of this novel, I have to study more, but the point of this novel is that it didn't happen and we see that it doesn't. We don't see any social changes going on in this novel. Indeed, what we see is that the system is kind of so so uh, ineffectual that the town itself dies. So, so clearly this novel's not saying that. If you talk to Mexican historians, they say, in fact, the Mexican Revolution was a novelist. Um, was a real revolution. What does that mean? A real revolution in modern terms 
is something that actually changes things. <laughs> so the French Revolution actually changed the way people think about government. The Mexican Revolution did result in some land reform. It did. There was land taken away from people, including the church, and distributed, although church properties were basically taken by those atheistic revolutionaries, a lot of them, and uh, used, just appropriated for personal reasons. But um, Carlos Fuentes has been an acquaintance of mine for a long time, mainly because I've invited him to the University of Houston several times to give lectures, which he's glad to do if I can raise his huge his huge fee, which I usually can, so he's come <laughs> a lot of times. No, he's a, he's a friend. And I was asking him about Colombia at one point during the drug wars in Colombia, because as you know, I have a particular interest in Colombia, and how it was that Colombia simply could fall into this chaos of drug wars, and before that, the chaos of the la violencia. And he says, Lois, he says, they didn't have their Mexican Revolution. And I said, oh, really? And he says, yeah, they're, at the beginning of the century, 20th century, Colombia did not have what Mexico had, which was a major civil war that did throw up things into the air and did change structures and did democratize and did distribute. Now that's Carlos Fuentes speaking and he's Mexican, but he knows his history up one side and down the other. And I guess I sort of have to agree with him. The other thing one might say is that Colombia is farther from the United States. Now, what does that mean? That it's good to be a neighbor of the United States? Absolutely not. But on the other hand, there, Colombia, for example, had to form an army, as did the Southern Cone, because they felt that Mexico's never had an army. What good would it do them just south of the U.S.? If they were going to be invaded, they know the U.S. has a huge army. And furthermore, if they were going to invade the U.S., they'd know they would lose, so they don't bother with, with an army. So the proximity of Mexico to the U.S. has had some effect, but it's a very different history in the 20th century from, say, Colombia. Um, so, so there are, um, Julie, all this to answer your question, there are uh, thinkers who've thought a lot about it and say, yeah, the, the, the Mexican Revolution did have a huge social changing effect. So um, still, on the other hand, when you think of the pre, the, the, the single party system that lasted basically from 1930, 1928 to, to 2000, then you wonder what kind of democratic reform that, that really was. So I guess it depends on your definition of democracy in part. So, Okay, listen, I'll let you go. I'm sorry I did all the talking today, but I wanted to cover a lot of territory. We don't have class on Thursday, and I will see you on Tuesday. We have a quiz on Tuesday on this novel. Have a, have a nice week.